A very good evening to you and welcome to Wednesday's news. Now, among tonight's headlines, Asylum Deal raises questions about West Papua in future and new law, new plan for Manam resettlement. But before that, after two years of construction, what has now become one of the biggest ports in the South Pacific has finally been opened. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill was in late today to cut the ribbons to the late Tidal Basin project and declared it open for business. The new port is expected to capture a significant portion of the maritime business in the Asia-Pacific region. Today saw the opening of the first phase of construction for the late Tidal Basin project. This is one of the biggest development projects in Morobe province with more than 700 million kina. It was jointly funded by the Asian Development Bank and the national government and was completed within two years. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill in his keynote address says the need for this multi-million kina project has been pressing for so many years. This is a, also another demonstration of our ability as a country and as a government, as a community and as people to deliver world-class infrastructure in our country. The late Tidal Basin, once completed, would be the biggest port in the South Pacific. This will totally transform the economy of Papua New Guinea as Lay becomes a shipping gateway in the Southeast Asia region. State Enterprises Minister Ben Micah says the government's plan is to make Lay a major port in the northern part of Papua New Guinea. Thank you to all the coffee people and all the other companies operating in the Highlands region, in Madeira and Sipi and in the New Guinea Islands. We believe that this port will assist in making business for you become more cost effective and also become more efficient. The national government has also allocated 500 million kina towards the construction of the second phase of this project. This will see an additional three more beds to be completed by 2018. Sylvester Gawi, National MTV News, Lay. Papua New Guinea's biosecurity measures will be reviewed by experts after serious concerns that the 400 million kina industry could collapse if struck by disease. Chief Secretary Sir Manasup Ezurinoa said the aim is to provide an assessment on the current measures and guidelines that exist. MTV Sarah Alpong reports. This is in response to concerns raised by the Poultry Industry Association regarding imports of fresh chicken meat and eggs from Australia. The government will take a three-pronged approach in responding to the concerns. Please. The plan is to firstly conduct a biosecurity two, risk four, four, assessment. Two, two, two. The results will then be used to create a protocol that should be followed when importing poultry. Experts will also be tasked to conduct an economic analysis of the industry. The review will to, should, should take place about January, February, and we should have an outcome uh, towards the end of first quarter. The PIA concerns reached a critical point last year when PNG continued to import poultry products from Australia during the outbreak of the bird flu in that country. In a conference last week, PIA President Stanley Lee said this is unacceptable. We are being exposed to disease risks that countries worldwide, including our closest neighbours in Australia, New Zealand and Fiji, consider unacceptable and unmanageable. And, and the reviews to tell us exactly where our failures are, where our failings are, where, 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 where our strengths are. And based on that review, we can, we can, we can work out exactly, exactly what we need to do. When contacted, the National Agriculture Quarantine and Inspection Authority could not comment on the issue because their managing director is still on duty travels overseas. This review will come under the government's national working group that is tasked to improve PNG's business and investment climate. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. The processing of asylum seekers held at the Manus Detention Centre has received more government support than the West Papuan refugees. Concerns have now been raised as to why less time is taken to process asylum seekers while that of the West Papuans have taken years. But PNG Immigration says the two groups are not under the same arrangement. The asylum seekers held in Manus province and West Papuans falls under two different categories. All I know Manus, um, all come and in it, law arrangement when them Australia where all call them RRA, uh, regional resettlement uh, arrangement. Now this law arrangement, um, you know, including all West Papuans. Um, not a law arrangement, long, all I know where all Australia is kissing me come. 
Two months ago, the government reconsidered giving citizenship to West Papuans, but only to those that have settled more than eight years and have had registered as refugee. Government is making this decision or same. All get up by um, must, get, must register. Now, also the qualify long citizenship by naturalization or same and been stopped more than eight like Christmas and been kissing registration pennies or some looks of some refugee pennies and by me by can help him long um, all can apply long citizenship. Yesterday, Australian Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, Scott Morrison, visited Manus province and facilitated the opening of new projects, including the transit facility. This facility in East Lorengau will accommodate genuine asylums and transfers. The first 50 genuine asylums held in Lombroom are expected to be transferred to these new facilities once their visas are issued by PNG Immigration. The genuine asylums will settle here and learn English, talk pisin and local way of life before choosing where else to settle in PNG. And they would be here for three months maximum. They learn the language, they learn the culture, and then they go out and work in other parts of the country. Well, they can remain in Papua New Guinea and uh, come up citizens or whatever according to the law of the country. Or... The Manus asylum deal has come under much controversy in its initial stage and despite new developments Australian government is implementing, the local people are still critical on some of its activities. Quinten Alomp, National MTV News. The opposition has raised concerns about the number of grade 12 students not securing placing in higher learning institutions in the country. Much of the blame has been put on the free education policy. Opposition leader Don Pollier wants the government to focus more on improving the capacity of universities and other higher learning institutions to solve this problem. Every year, certain percentage of grade 12 students enter tertiary institutions. Next year will be the same with only 10% of the total number of grade 12 this year expected to secure a place in. This has the opposition questioning the government's policy on free education. Well, what has happened is the Prime Minister and the government seem to think, ah, well, we're paying for uh, the uh, tuition fee of all students. Good, we have done a job. But the opposition position is no. Uh, we've, we must keep in mind that the free education only addresses basic knowledge and literacy. End of story. Leader of the opposition, Don Polier, views the policy not as a catalyst for creating employment, rather as harmful for integral human development. He proposed that the government should focus its attention more on building the capacity of universities and other tertiary institutions in the country. It's about increasing the number of institutions throughout the country. But the first step is to build a capacity in the existing. That's where the challenge is. Polia believes the opposition has the answers to this ongoing problem. He says they have workable and comprehensive policies focused on integral human development. Their objective is to have 100% employment for all young Papua New Guineans in the next 10 to 15 years. However, that can only happen if the opposition is in power. Mickey Cavera, National MTV News. The opposition has also criticised the government's intention to control population. Leader Don Pollier branded it as inappropriate, urging the government to deliver social services and create employment to address population growth. He said population control should be left to the people and not the government to impose laws. All search shares on the Australian stock market, stock exchange rather, have been closely scrutinised by the, by the opposition. The continuous fall in its share prices has again been questioned. Opposition leader Don Pollier maintains that the idea to purchase the shares by government was not in the best interest of the people. And among stories coming up after the break, teachers awaiting leave entitlements and Jmart supermarket resumes business. The details after the break. Good to have you back with the news. Teachers from all over the Moorabe province are still waiting for their leave entitlements with less than seven days from Christmas. Amongst their worries is a 10% cut from their entitlements going to travel agencies. Teachers say this problem has been the same for more than 10 years. 
It's eight days before Christmas and teachers in Moroba are becoming frustrated. Their leave efforts haven't been paid by the Moroba Provincial Education Department. They say the issue is the 10% deduction to third-party travel agencies. And sometimes we get half because it is going to a third-level airline or to another third-party travel agent and we lose some percentage. I don't know that if, it's that, if that is legal or that is a system. Kennedy speaks on behalf of the group held out today at the provincial building. It comes after last year when Finance Minister James Marape, who was then Education Minister, explained that leave entitlements would be paid into salaries. But next year, the leave pays will be part of the uh, closing year salaries. Uh, uh, that we, so we put it in with, with the salary. Over 500 teachers based in Moroba are expecting to get their entitlements from the Provincial Education Office before Christmas. It's been an ongoing problem that happens end of every year. Meanwhile, the provincial administrator could not be reached for comments as he was in a meeting discussing ways of addressing the issue. Colin Barilai, National MTV News, Lay. A gender-based violence strategy will, for the first time, be tabled in Parliament next year. This is one of the attempts made by the Community Development Department and Development Partners to address gender-based violence, sorcery and other forms of violence. However, the department remains underfunded, resulting in partners withdrawing their services. Acting Secretary Anna Solomon says although they receive funding from the government, it is not enough to fully support the key social services. They include the country's welfare office, civil registry office, women, youth, elderly and disability. Um, and so the funding we get is really enough for the operations of the department, the daily operations, um, certain invitations, certain programs um, like that are like service oriented, like the routine work our welfare offices do. For example, if there's a kidnapping case, maintenance case, court case, those are the daily routine work they deal with and the funding is just enough for that. Development partners that have assisted the department to come up with key policies and perhaps bills and then laws to protect the rights of women and children and policies to eliminate all forms of violence have withdrawn their services due to lack of funding. Difficult, but, but our development partners have been um, really good. Um, OZAID and New Zealand Aid and American um, Aid and, and UN. and. Um, a, for them, a bulk of their funding goes to gender and children, especially UNICEF. And so that has, um, you know, they've really helped us support many of the programs. The Gender-Based Violence Strategy Bill is an important legislative that will be tabled on the floor of Parliament by the Minister Responsible Delilah Gore in February next year. What's contained in the bill are ways on how the policies will be implemented by all stakeholders through to the district level. However, coordination has been a challenge for the government to implement much of the policies. Impediments that will hopefully not be dragged into the new year. Bridget Komatep, National MTV News. A doctor at the Port Moresby General Hospital has revealed the stabbing of a police officer at Jack Piddick Park on Sunday night is the fourth stabbing victim this month. He said the area is not safe anymore for families to gather and celebrate the festive season. MTV's Vasinatayama reports. Dr. Sony Kibob didn't want to appear on camera, but said there were three previous cases of men being stabbed from Jack Pidik Park during and after the night's festive celebrations. The stabbing of the police officer Kia Totana on Sunday night has raised alarm bells. All cases have a similar story of opportunists trying to pick pocket or snatch mobile phones while people are taking photos of the Christmas lights. Kia Totana is in his mid-20 and is from Kainantu in Eastern Highlands Province. He is part of the Beat Patrol and is based in Gordon's police station. On Sunday night, he was stabbed three times on his chest and was rushed to the emergency ward. Dr. Kibob confirmed that Kia's condition is now stable. He said people's safety and security is not guaranteed, so everyone must look after themselves when attending the celebration. 
Meanwhile, NCD and Central Divisional Commander Jerry Frank said police officers are doing foot patrols every night. I must commend the public of, uh, of our well behave and, and they have been very supportive. When officers affect arrest at Pidic Park, they come forward and assist and uh, there have never been any, any, reper, any retaliation of that matter. Of my officer said. Dr. Kibob said he is sure more patients will come to the emergency section on such related case. Basina Tayama, National MTV News. Port Moresby's Jmart Shopping Centre has resumed business after a week of closure. The shop lost almost its entire stock of goods worth thousands of kina to looters a week ago during a standoff between the police and army. The shop was reopened on Saturday following public demand. Its closure has affected both vendors and the buying public, forcing nearby residents to travel to Manotha Port or Baroko to shop. We are sold here, sir. And we don't all yet, all force yet. All force him, all public law work in this law. You know, you know, I must put through. The shop lost most of its goods, like mattresses, stereos, and cooking wares. Its entire alcohol section was ransacked in the looting. Such time store passed, I had no excess loss and cut him all. One of them, shopping them, like Gola. And let's have Gola Manu come next, Goran Doyan, and Kim Wobati Gola, where resident Lumpla. Now store opium, you plug good, you plug good, like excess law. Walk him shopping, and Kim Taxi Gola, resident Lumpla. Shop managers have refused to comment on camera but said it was the worst looting in JMAT's business operations. They said the total damage is in the hundred thousands and will take months to recover all that was lost. Today is the fourth day of business and most of its shelves are still empty. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. The National Development Bank says it is confident of expanding its success into 2015 with new programs set to benefit the small to medium enterprises. A course on starting businesses has ended in Port Moresby, giving participants the skills needed to grow their own enterprises. This is one of the latest programs that has come about as the National Development Bank moves into a stronger financial position. This is a far cry from what things were like in 2005 when the bank was in financial trouble. And now we take a look at the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.388 US dollars in the interbank market. And at Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3805 US dollars, 0.459 Australian dollars, 0.3008 Euro, and 43.9 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold and cocoa closed higher, coffee, copper, crude oil, and copper closed lower. And lastly, on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 112 points lower, the ASX closed at 9 points higher, and the All Ordinaries closed at 9 points higher as well. More to come on National MTV News tonight. Ramu Nico is struggling financially, customers warned of unsafe products, and the remains of U.S. soldiers repatriated. That's coming up next. Thanks for your company and welcome back to the news. Chinese mining company Ramu Nikko says it is facing serious deficit and technical challenges after operating for two years. President of Ramu Nikko project Wang Qicheng says the current low nickel price is hitting the company hard. He called on all stakeholders to be optimistic. The financial constraints has forced the company to get a loan from the MCC group to secure the project. Well, the Christmas buying period has begun and with the New Year's sales just around the corner, shoppers are encouraged to be aware of unsafe products on the shelves. The warning comes as the Independent Consumer and Competition Commission completed its annual pre-Christmas toy survey. The survey showed that certain shops are still selling dangerous toys and other items without proper labels. At a media conference held this afternoon at the ICCC office, Samples of dangerous toys were displayed to create awareness for consumers during this festive season. During a pre-Christmas survey of 146 shops, a high number of banned toys that do not meet consumer product safety standards were found on the shelves. Products that have been banned include certain aquatic toys, toy-like novelty cigarette lighters, yo-yo water balls, small high-powered magnets, 
and non-English labeled foodstuff. Some of these products do not have safety labels like the need for adult supervision. Others, like the yo-yo water balls, contain toxic content inside. We also found that out of the 146 shops uh, surveyed, 10 traders continue to sell products banned by the IEEC. The tra traders were informed of the ban and advised to remove the products from the shelves. IEEC will do a risk assessment and take the appropriate actions to safeguard consumers. Businesses have also been warned to remove such products from the shelves as IEEC will be monitoring this situation. A list of products banned by the Commission is provided to PNG Customs. Customs officials will monitor and seize these products if found at the, at the ports. Uh, we have a MOU with uh, PNG Customs. Making this sort of uh, information known through the media is important to PNG consumers. Consumers are encouraged to contact the IEEC if they see any of the banned items or non-English labeled products in shops for appropriate action to be taken. Delhi Bagu, National MTV News. The National Research Institute yesterday relaunched one of the country's oldest publications. The Papua New Guinea Journal of Education was shelved in 2007. But through an agreement between the NRI, Department of Education, and the University of Garauka, the journal has been revived and rebranded. The relaunch of the PNG Journal of Education marks its rebirth and rebranding as an important academic publication. The PNG Journal of Education ceased in 2007, but with an agreement between partners NRI, National Department of Education, and the University of Goroka, the journal was revived last year and relaunched yesterday. NRI Director Dr. Thomas Webster, Acting Deputy Secretary for Teacher Education Dr. Apelis Eliakim, and Vice Chancellor of the University of Goroka Dr. Gairo Onagi, all acknowledged that the publication is a premier journal of education in PNG to serve policy makers and implementers researchers and teachers. Dr. Onagi said the journal was the benchmark of academic writing with its different scopes on education. Dr. Elia Kim added that there was a need for a research code of ethics in PNG for accurate data collection. As a scholarly publication of significance, the journal will be published twice a year. Researchers and academics are invited to contribute articles. The journal is a joint effort and initiative of the NRI, National Department of Education, University of Goroka, and it is being maintained by the NRI. Delhi Bagu, National MTV News. Remains of U.S. servicemen killed in action in Papua New Guinea during World War II were given a special ceremony this morning at Port Moresby's Jackson's Airport. The ceremony was to pay tribute to the heroism of those lost and the ties between the people of the United States and PNG. The ceremony follows a successful underwater investigation and recovery mission near a bowl in the East New Britain province. The repatriation ceremony is U.S. government's effort under the Joint Prisoners of War Missing in Action Accounting Command to identify American soldiers fought in PNG during World War II. The joint sets operation was conducted last month in Rabaul, East New Britain, on board the United States naval ship Safeguard. The ceremony this morning embraces those who sacrifice for victory and the promise to bring their bodies to the families in the United States. Our nation remembers the good deeds of the fallen and treasures their memory. U.S. Ambassador to PNG Walter North said the ceremony would not have been possible through the combined efforts of PNG National Museum, PNG Defense Force and the government of PNG. However, there is much more work to be done with over 2,000 U.S. soldiers yet to be recovered from battlefields and aircraft sites throughout PNG and the Pacific. We promised them and the families of those who are still unaccounted for that the search will continue. The remains of those gathered in rubble were given appropriate honors before being transported to Hawaii for further forensic and analysis. A formal document was also signed between the PNG National Museum 
to signify the official transfer of the soldiers' remains to the U.S. government. Jack LaPava, Jr., National MTV News. And that report concludes our news segment tonight. True Guy Sports is coming up next, and I'll give you all the details after the break. Stay tuned. True Kai Sports. Welcome to True Kai Sports. Following the PNG Puk Puk's long-awaited qualifier for the HSBC World Servant Sec Circuit, the International Rugby Board has announced the pools for the 2015 Wellington Sevens. Papua New Guinea has been placed in Pool B alongside tough competitors New Zealand, England and Canada. The Puk Puk's have less than two months of preparations as the first of the World Series Sevens Circuit will be staged from the 6th to the 7th of February. And in case you didn't know, today marks 99 days to go before the 2015 Pacific Games Relay begins leading to the main event on July 4th. For many, it is the day to look forward to as the nation prepares to bring to light the country's untapped biodiversity through sports. The 2015 Pacific Games Organizing Committee CEO, Peter Stewart, says he won't rest until success is achieved. Described as the land of unexpected and land of opportunity, PNG is just 99 days away from the 2015 Pacific Games Relay prior to the opening ceremony. The Games Relay journey will cover from the farthest western reaches of PNG through the mainland and out to the islands. Every province will have few days in which to showcase the people, the culture and the natural beauty of the land. 22 provinces are mapped out to be part of the event. Games Relay manager Tamsi Wardley expressed satisfaction with the organizing of the relay with more than 10,000 people to be involved and an estimated 250,000 people to be part of the experience. The committee has secured 55 million kina, including more than 30 million kina from the corporate sponsorships, to meet the set target of 60 million kina to fund the Games. We have secured, thanks to the efforts of government and our minister, the 150% tax deductibility has gone through NEC, has gone through the two readings, we're waiting on the final gazette, but it is law. It is law now, and you will all be eligible as long as it's over 500,000 and one kina. Uh, you are eligible for the 150% tax deductibility. So please rest assured that is in the bag. Stewart said the GOC wants to ensure every element required for the Games is delivered. The first porting equipment arrived in the country last week. The seven laser sailing boats arrived, while 20 more will be arriving soon. Athletes training towards the Games, including both in the country and overseas, like the numerous sailing in the ISAF Sailing World Cup in Melbourne, under the Go for Gold program through the PNG Olympic Committee, are setting the 2015 targets with no doubts to stamp their marks on home soil. Terry Alex, National MTV Sports. Following the Barramundi's recent success in their first ever one day international match against Hong Kong, Australian cricket has now expressed interest in taking on rising northern neighbours, PNG, in an ODI match. Barramundis became the first national team to win back-to-back one-day internationals, which now puts them at 15th on the International Cricket Council's ranking. Cricket Australian chairman Wally Edwards has recognised Cricket PNG's efforts on and off the field, which has contributed to the growth of the sport in the country. He says while it is perhaps a little way off, an ODI between PNG and Australia is a pending prospect. And True Guy Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. True Guy Sports. Good to have you back with True Guy Sports. Overseas now to NRL. It's a long way from Redfern, but the shadow of Sam Burgess is still looming large at South Sydney. He's still an inspiration for Rabbitohs players as the club begins its plan for the Premiership defence. For many, the charity shield marks the unofficial start of the rugby league season. Next year's clash between the Rabbitohs and Dragons will be one of the first chances Tim Grant gets to impress at his new home. It was a bit daunting at first to start a new club. I've been a Penrith, you know, I was there for a long time. Grant's time at the foot of the mountains didn't end well, languishing in the New South Wales Cup. 
but the former Origin player says he doesn't hold any grudges. To be honest, you know, I, I don't feel that I've got anything to prove to um, anyone. Grant and Glenn Stewart have been added to the Bunnies pack to cover for the loss of Sam Burgess. Sam's left a, a great legacy for our club and, you know, a fair, fair uh, blueprint there for, um, you know, what it means to play for South Sydney. The Dragons have also said goodbye to one of their club favourites, Brett Morris, leaving to join his brother Josh at the Bulldogs. Red V fans are devastated by the move, with some threatening to not renew their membership. It, it, I know, I understand the fans, but it's reality. It's rugby league, it's sport, it's professional sport, and I think we've all got to move on from it. And in cricket, India has taken the upper hand on day one of the second test in Brisbane. The visitors reaching four for 311 at stumps. A new era of Australian cricket, and with it, a debutante in Josh Hazelwood. Nerves too for the new captain as his reign started. Eight. I think it's a, a decent toss to lose. But his quicks didn't get him the early breakthrough he was after, as VJ saw off the openers. Oh, he lays into that one. He goes over the top of Nathan Lyon. Johnson tried to ruffle feathers. Glove and I think a bit of grill, I reckon. Over an hour into play before the first to fall. Out, got him, bottom edge, maybe toe of the bat. Mitch Marsh with his first test wicket. Moments later, his brother Sean spilled a chance and VJ made the Aussies pay. That's a half folly and that'll be four and that'll be 50 from really VJ. The first over after lunch, Australia's injury curse continued. Mitch Marsh pulling up lame with a tight hamstring. I think that's a problem. The pace attack needed a lift and Hazelwood provided it. His first test scalp coming with a little help from the umpire. Oh, it's taken the side of the grill, I think. India again haunted by its decision to shelve DRS for the series. After two centuries in Adelaide, Virat Kohli loomed the danger man. Not this time. Let's take Coley gone for just 19, but the searing heat took its toll on our bowlers. Stark and Hazelwood both spent time on the sidelines as VJ notched triple figures. One of the greatest achievements by an Indian batsman, a Gabba 100. The opener unaware of his milestone. Oh, hello. I'm on 100. He continued to ride his luck, Sean Marsh dropping him for the second time. Haddon's hands as safe as ever. Oh, here we go, Brad Haddon's got him. VJ gone for 144. Then moments before stumps, another injury concern, Josh Hazelwood leaving the field. And that ends True Guy Sports tonight. The weather details coming up after these short messages. True Guy Sports. True Guy Sports. This weather information is brought to you by Tablebirds. Looking at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in southern region, Port Moresby to look forward to cloudy weather and showers in the afternoon, evening showers in Karama, cloudy then fine weather in Daru, a stray of thunderstorms expected in Popondeta, and fine weather in Alata. In Momase, a couple of thunderstorms expected in Lay City, cloudy with thunderstorms with a shower or two in Medang, occasional rain in Weewak, and morning showers expected in Vanimore. In the New Guinea Islands, Kokopo to look forward to cloudy weather, then evening rain, rain drizzle in Buka, occasional rain in Lorengau, and morning showers, then rain in Kaviang and Kimbe. And lastly in the Highlands region, Karoka and Kundiawa, thunderstorms, cloudy weather with thunderstorms expected in other centres. Now a quick recap of our main headlines tonight before we go. Big expectations as PM opens the late title basin. Also, asylum deal raises questions about West Papuan future and teachers in Morabe still waiting for leave entitlements. Well, that's been the news, sports and weather tonight. On behalf of the news crew, I'm Tokana Hasavi. Thanks for your company. You take care and stay safe. Good night.